Girl, I have to talk about Inez and her half-brother, Constantine. Oh, is that her half-brother? Yeah. He was called a bastard at one point, I think in episode two. Okay. This Constantine character, what a dope. Girl, what a dummy. Shannon Richese ran a con on him so quick, so quick. He gave her, he gave <laughs> dog her, walk. He gave her the <laughs> info, like, oh, you can just see it on her face. Like he starts to talk about his feelings, and she's like, "Up, oh, I got my way in." And then the next thing you know, he's told her about Desmond. Yeah. Help boost this video by giving it a like, and to not miss out on other coverage, make sure you're subscribed. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Amber here with Laura, and we are on our Dune Prophecy watch. We are going to be covering the first three episodes, so we're at our mid-season finale. Also, Laura and I are not Dune experts. We are looking at this show from way outside of the Dune fandom. So we're not going to be talking about lore or anything like that. It's going to be a lot of speculation. It's all speculation on my part. Same. <laughs> That's what's keeping me invested in this show. I have so many questions. Oh, so do I. There is a mystery to solve here. So far, what I've kind of gauged the plot line to be is three different storylines, I guess. We've got this intergalactic war that's about to have a showdown between Javi, 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 Javico? Yeah, Javico and Natalia, and then the Richesis. The Richesis. I only know one of their, I only know the kids' names. Sci-fi fantasy shows, you got to get accustomed to the names. This is, I feel like, a problem for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> my problem is, is if you don't stand out enough, my brain's not going to log the name long term. So like, no, on my Dune board, it's just Mom Richese, Dad Richese, then Shannon and Pruitt. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like we've got this intergalactic war situation between these two houses. And then we've got this Harkonnen, Atreides, Hatfield and McCoy situation where these two houses are at each other's throats. So we've got this Harkonnen quest for revenge. And then the third plot line is what the crap is going on within the sisterhood and this breeding program that has been passed down from the Mother Superior to Valia. I feel like that's a pretty strong premise to get going on. Yeah, definitely. As far as the intrigue stuff, what's... What's holding your attention the most? Desmond. Okay. Is it a... Yeah, he's got a big old question mark above his head. What's going on with Desmond? Is the video real? Is it fake? Like... Right. We... First of all, we can't guarantee that the video is real. So from my perspective... Oh, are we going to get into theory crafting already? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's, do, let's it. do it. All right. So from my perspective, my current theory is that Desmond works for an extremist faction within the Bene Gesserit, like the one, the faction of Dorotea's. And from my perspective, like rebellions and uprisings don't usually necessarily die with their leader. They just kind of withdraw and then regroup. Yes. So that leaves me thinking that his power is something similar to the honing the skill of the voice. I would agree. I feel like this is something that has to be learned. You don't just kind of wake up and decide, hey, I'm going to figure out how to do this. There's a lot of question, though, because like even the Bene Gesserit are questioning if this is a, a gift from the creator. Like, let's just call it a worm gift. And then some other questions I have is, do you think Michaela is a double agent? Which one is Michaela? Michaela is the sister, is the... Reverend Mother that Mother Superior Valia meets on the docks towards the end of episode three. She also meets with her in secret in a different era, like I think in episode two. And she had the blue eyes that was posing yes, as she's stationed on Arrakis yes. and Reverend Mother Michaela seems to be in charge of a like cell of re like a rebel cell. Yeah. Like she helped them orchestrate the harvester robbery. Because Mother Superior was like, excellent manipulation there. But Michaela never really touches on whether Desmond actually comes in contact with High Shalud. Is that how, is that it? 
Worm God. <laughs> God, I've, uh, my my jokey little nicknames for what comes in later Dune stories is infiltrated my entire perception of the worms. But I think you're right. I think it is Shai Halud. So she never really touches on whether Desmond actually comes in contact or not. She just, they talk about burning the cell now that they need to prop up the emperor's strengths and not make him look weak anymore. So obviously we can see just in that conversation alone how much influence and behind the scenes like moving of pieces around the board the Bene Gesserit are doing. Yeah, I think what a really awesome twist would be is if Desmond is actually the child of one of the sisters that was given up because we have that line of exposition. They don't raise their own children. Once they have one, they give it up so that there's no like attachments and the sisterhood comes first. That said, that would be a wild twist if he's actually coming from someone who was spurned inside the sisterhood due to maybe this rule or maybe one of the sisters that was opposing this breeding program or, you know, just something like that. Someone who's got an ax to grind. Yeah. How do you feel about how we're jumping all over the timeline? I don't mind it at all. It makes it harder in terms of like a recap situation to kind of like collect thoughts. Yeah. I have like a base timeline broken down, which is we have the thinking machine war and then In those next 86 years of that post-machine war, we have in there Mother Raquel creates the breeding program for the great houses. Dorothea leads the faction against the breeding program. We have everything that happens on Lancavale with the Harkonnens. And then all of that kind of converges where we see the story like pick up in present day. Valia's mother superior, Tula's kind of her right hand, Valia's kind of traveling around trying to get a the lay of the land. Yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah, we're just, we're all over in a timeline. I think with Desmond, the big question is how is he, okay, he's got two, two gifts going on. He can burn people from within. That's wild. And then secondly, how does he manage to counteract the voice? How's he doing this? Well, like I said, I assume that it's similar. It's like a honing skill. So you'd have to have somebody who can teach you how to resist the voice. Or I guess we could toss that. I'm, I'm struggling to believe that this is all a worm gift. Me too. Just because it was so out in the open, it was just like, oh, like he's special. It was the worm. And then it's glossed over from that point. Right. Which makes me think that that's not real. Yeah. And all they have to go on it is his word and then some video. Like a shaky CCTV video? Yeah. (laughs) Yes. I mean, I'm sorry. I watch too much Law & Order to know that videos can be fake. (laughs) Right. Okay. (laughs) So far with Desmond, he can't, he has his like internal irradiation skill internal burning and he can resist the voice do you think he's gonna have like other special abilities that are gonna show up Ooh, because i mean reckless confidence is already one of them right yeah he is flat out when they ask him when mother superior asks him if he did it he's like yeah like he's not even trying to pretend and then when he goes to father haviko uh em- dad haviko emperor haviko yeah he's like yeah i did it and i can do it again tell me you know who you want yeah <laughs> like, I'll, he keeps I'll burn them all he keeps <laughs> offering himself up as some sort of weapon of war which personally i were the emperor i would be like mm, that's sus you're just coming out of nowhere and you want to like destroy all my enemies in the Richese house, which like the Richese's must be like one of the big great houses, you know, like in the future, how the Harkonnens and the Atreides are. Mm-hmm. I don't know if burning out the entire like Richese family is going to like win the emperor any points here. And also the the bigger overview of this is, is he trying to start this war? 
is he actually not even invested in helping House Javico? Is he actually trying to start a war and kind of hiding behind this idea of, oh, you know, like, I'm your dog. Tell me who to attack and I'll do it. Right. And you don't, you can't keep someone like that around because you don't know where his allegiances lie and what's to stop him from taking you out. Well, one area we know his allegiances do not lie is with Mother Superior Valia, as we see when she's all like, put the blade to your throat. And he like kind of gives her a smirk. And he's like, yeah, I, I wanted to see what you would be most afraid of. And now I've seen it. He also seems to have some like premonition type gift because he's saying like a trail of blood follows you wherever you go or something to that matter where I'm like, okay, so is he looking into the past? Like, is he is he seeing something in the future? What exactly, or is he just taunting her? Right. You know? Well, you know, something I just thought about is like his allegiance to the emperor and the empress. I don't know if we've really gotten any sort of like idea of how they view the Fremen on Arrakis. There's too little Arrakis stuff going on right now to know anything about whether or not that's going to become super relevant. Right. Like, I'm still hoping we get more, but we're three episodes in. There's only six episodes. I would be surprised if they add in more characters at this point because it's, it's such a short season. Right. But I don't know. New locations typically mean new characters, new plots. So is there enough time for that? I'm not sure. Huh. Yeah. Do you want to talk some about what's going on with Tula and Lila? Because yes. that's another that's another plot point that I was pretty excited to see how it's unfolding. Okay. So before we get into that, I want to bring up something that I just, I have a feeling about. Oh, okay. And it kind of works with that. Inside this you know this sisterhood it seems like we've got two quasi leaders going on with Tula and Valia. Valia has this personality of kind of a she's a bit of like this renegade freedom fighter like she's very emotional she gives these really impassioned speeches she's a great character to lead to be the face of an organization to be the face of you know this revenge plot even though it doesn't really seem like she's had a lot to do in terms of the revenge against the Atreides because going back to that whole plot line I've rewatched it and I've looked at all of the dialogue Valia never sent her to kill anyone and if she did it was off screen but in the aftermath when they return home Tula's family is like she made you do this she put this in your head and Tula is resolute. She was like, I did this on my own. Like, I chose this. So it doesn't really seem like she was commanded to do it. But she has all of these other skill sets going on where I'm like, man, she kind of feels like the brains behind an operation because she's very crafted and honed in poisons. And you see her almost like, as a physicist or something in this lab, she's tinkering around with stuff. She knows about like how to create these things and she's using this machine to keep Lila alive. Oh, not just any machine though. That is a, th a thinking machine. That is a thinking machine named An Anna Rule. So, okay. So we've got that happening. We've got these two women. I'm not sure if they are... Who's the leader? Who's taking orders and who's receiving them? Because at this point, it doesn't feel like they're on the same footing. Let me go back. I wrote down some of the dialogue here. I think you're right because even Anu Rule was like, you don't have the authorization to do this. And Tula was like, Mother Superior is off planet and you will do this now. Yeah. So Sister Avila says, Mother Tula, you're preparing this, you're preparing this Rosak poison and she says it's my own experiment is this for one of our acolytes are they undergoing the agony and tula says you can report to valia that sister lila will be making her own decision and no matter how many spies she sends she cannot control everything mother Va uh, valia's has a right to be concerned 
you can't leave the fate of the Imperium in the hands of one child. She has the right to choose for herself. So it seems like she's running this whole... Yeah, but this goes in... Agony. Yeah, but this like loops back into like one of my big questions is when Lila gets inside of the agony... I don't know how else to like really. She's looking frame for that. her mom, right? She's looking for her mom, and Tula planted that in her head, right? But Raquel shows up, delivers like an in agony prophecy type thing, which is the key to yeah. the reckoning: is one born twice, once in blood and once in spice. All revenant full, a revenant full of scars, a weapon born of war on a path too short, and. So that comes out. We get that, like, prophecy, basically. And then guess who shows up in there, too? Dorothea. And she's like, bitch killed me. You know, I got to take you from her. But she says, like, that she's stealing. What did she say to them? You stole my future, so I'm taking your hope. Yeah. How did Dorothea know to show, like, how did her spirit i guess show up at just the right time because they really needed to do this obviously or they wouldn't have put a child who wasn't prepared through this what's the question again how was dorothea able to time this with the agony like there's a lot of questions i have about that too is it just because once you have the Rossack poisoning, you're able to communicate with all of the past Ooh. members who has also gone through the ritual? That could be, but how... Like, are they all in just, like, a soul pool? Right. Shitty chatting to each other? But how <laughs> would Dorothea's, like, spirit or soul know to identify Lila as someone important to them? Yeah, that's a good question. Unless she can see the memories of Valia Ooh. and Tula because they have also done the ritual. Okay. Are they able to communicate with what's going on in the real world by like just not communicate but understand what's happening via the connection of the poison? They could be. That's a good way to think about it. So going back to Tula... The way that she manipulated Lila feels very sus to me. And at first I thought, you know, like maybe she's just being like commanded. She's going off of Valia's commands. I, after going back, I absolutely 100% disagree with that. I think Tula is acting as a free agent on almost all aspects of any of the really messed up stuff that she's doing. When we go back to this third episode, we have another interaction where she's preparing Lila's body and another sister comes in and says, keeping her in this limbo sows pain and confusion. I'm sorry that this happened, but Mother Valia has made it clear how we handle cases like this. We must let her go. And Tula's like, nah, dog, I'm hooking her up. And she does it. Yeah, because we find out that Spice could regenerate, like, her brain function if the exact right dose is administered. Right. And as this show continues, there's no one who has the body count like Tula. Like, she has... I mean, she took down a large portion of the entire Atreides clan. Right. Like, it looked like an entire settlement of people. Yeah. And this is... It, it's interesting because she has that quiet calm introspective type personality of someone who she's incredibly lethal and deadly and the way that she enacts what she does is very thought out where I'm not sure Valia has that same personality type to go through these things she's more of like a mouthpiece I feel like well I feel like Valia and Tula have very different ultimate goals Valia is very very, very wrapped into, like, restoring the Harkonnen name. And Tula seemed more content with, like, revenge. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because even the revenge wasn't enough for Valya. Now she's, like, you know, we see at the end she meets with her family members who are in charge in Lancavale and, like, her really old uncle is there. And then I assume her nephew, who's now in charge because her brother died 
And we see that like she's meeting with them even after all these years, after all this power she has amassed, all of the control and the influence, she still wants to restore her family name. Yeah. And Tula just wants to save Lila, who she looks at like a daughter. I feel like Tula is incredibly conflicted. Yeah. Because she does seem to really care about Lila. But at the same time, her mission comes first and she's burning bridges to get to what she wants, whether, you know, it means the death of this young woman or the death of this entire Atreides outpost, whatever, <laughs> whatever they were. So it's like, what's her role going to be looking forward? Are we going to see something like... A showdown between the two of yeah. them? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that would be interesting. A fight for power between two siblings. Mm-hmm. Do we know if Tula can do the voice or if she has a special skill? I don't think that we've seen any evidence of that yet. I feel like her speciality is more in terms of like potions and technology. Like she's she's very intelligent. Oh, yeah. Very crafty, very cunning. She could really destroy things if she wanted to, left to her own devices. She's smart enough to pull some type of twist where no one would see it coming. She's definitely caught my attention. I think Tula is the one that I've spent the most time focusing on just because I'm so unsure of what her storyline means for the series. Ooh, because we're still in kind of the early days of the Benny Jesuit, Jesuit, right? Yeah. And we're getting to watch the like opening plans and plots of how they plan to guide humanity's future through like political influence in their genetic breeding program. And then, you know, we spend most of these first three episodes not really fully comprehending what this breeding program is, mm -hmm. because there's a couple times where you could think it's just like them taking samples and then like them deciding. But there was this point where Valia like indicates that there's something more that happens there. And then like, you know, we get to see the actual area at the end and it's just like a giant quantum computer. And now I get why they're saying things like, I checked, this is the match that'll secure the Carino line for centuries. Like, I'm sure. It's because an AI is making these determinations for them. Yeah, it's running the numbers. Right. I saw a post on Blue Sky from someone at Birds Are Dinosaurs. <laughs> they wrote, Dune has the same plot line as the Westminster dog show. After generations of careful breeding, we have produced this perfect little freak of nature, and now it has behavioral issues. I saw that too, and I thought that that was perfect. It's, it, it, yeah, like this whole like breeding program, why? Like, so Mother Superior is like, hey, this is all about stability. We are choosing the right people. You know, like it seems very like, mm, for harmony, for stability. And not like a mission of rule for the sisterhood. Yeah. Is it possible that the original Mother Superior, is it Raquel? Raquella. Raquella. Is it possible that she legitimately wanted this to be a thing about stability and that as things do, it kind of snowballs into actually we're going to use this for us and do things in a way to make sure that we remain in power no matter what. Well, yeah, because, like, the plot is actually to get a Bene Gesserit on the throne. And they're so close, if you think about it, because they've got Yanez Carino slated to enter training at the school and become a Bene Gesserit herself, and she's in line for the throne. She is the next, like, Empress of the Imperium. Girl, I have to talk about... Inez and her half-brother Constantine. Oh, is that her half-brother? Yeah. He was called a bastard at one point, I think in episode two. Okay. This Constantine character, what a dope. Girl. What a dummy. Shannon Richese ran a con on him so quick. So quick. He gave her he gave <laughs> Dog her, walk. He gave her the info like 
oh, you can just see it on her face. Like he starts to talk about his feelings and she's like, oh, I got my way in. And then the next thing you know, he's told her about Desmond. Yeah. You can see it in his face. You know, like, so her and Constantine hook up. She runs him for information. She gets what she needs. She goes back to her parents. She tells them. And then we have that, like, Carino Richese showdown in what I assume is, like, the throne room. And Mother Superior Valya shows up and kind of, like, breaks it up. But turns out she wants the same thing as the Richese. She wants to speak with Desmond. Why do you think... Since we're talking about this scene, what do you think Empress Natalia's opposition to the Bene Gesserit's influence and control, where do you think that comes from? Natalia is Emperor Havako's wife, right? Correct. I don't know. I don't either. I, don't know. I don't... know nothing. I know nothing about these houses. I don't know where, which house she came from. All we know is that she's really attempting to keep autonomy from the Bene Gesserit as rulers. And I yeah. keep wondering, like, if she's got another surprise in store for us, like, you know, Ooh. releasing Desmond. Okay, that's a good theory, because if they end up in cahoots and they have a strong bond, she can just send him out into the world to do what she wants. Right. And, like, as we see, she even pushes Yanez to not go to train with the Bene Gesserit. She's like, just rule how you want and marry who you want. Huh. Okay, now I'm going to have to focus on her. Oh my gosh, there's so many characters to focus on. Yeah, I, I liked going back to the Harkonnens because I was like, ah, it's Bobby B. Look at oh him. Oh my He's gosh. Back. I Bring the breastplate stretcher. <laughs> okay, real quick. I know this is about theories. And then the, there theories. was a Tully too. Yeah. There was a Tully boy. The Tully boy was there from House of the Dragon. Big Bobby B from Game of Thrones. We had Mrs. Feathering, we had Lady Featherington from Bridgerton, like, God. Calanthea. Cal yeah, Cal Queen Calanthe from The Witcher, but she's playing the exact same character, which fits her very well. This is like a star-studded event of fantasy actors. I honestly think, though, at this point, I'm throwing my lot in with House Javico. For one, the drip is immaculate. They look like olden-timey railroad tycoons in space i love it i also enjoy the daughter a lot she is a really fun character i'm always excited when she's back in play and the emperor javico he just he seems like weak and i don't mean like he doesn't have power but i mean he doesn't we haven't spent enough time to know his inside thoughts right and so i don't i i can only guess like what his plans are and they, they don't seem great. All I, I mean, I mean, all we know for sure is that he feels very lost without Kasha's guidance. That's true. That's true. Maybe that's what it is. Without her, he doesn't know what to do, what to say, how to act. I am huh. still curious. Well, I assume that Desmond had to kill Kasha off, too, because she presents too much interference. Like, yeah. how would Desmond get close to the emperor and empress with Kasha still in play. Because even when he first spoke with them, Kasha was like, yeah, what he says is true because he believes it to be true. Not necessarily that it's actually true in reality. It's like an eye said eye tactic. You yeah. Can, you, can, you can say something false if you believe that that is true. <laughs> right. I have another question here okay. about Lila. So they've got her all plugged in to the machine, the Lazarus Spice 3000. They're going to bring her back from the dead. How do they explain that if she wakes up? Everyone saw her die. I have they a, can't. I have a feeling Tula's just going to take the I'm big boss right now route. Like, you can't do shit. I'm in charge. I'll deal with Valya. And then I'm not sure what she's going to tell Valya, but I'm sure it's going to involve, like, Something about doing something for herself or, you know, not wanting to leave Lila to die. What about like in a public relations type scenario where if Lila wakes up and people see her out walking around, that whole sisterhood saw her die. Right. There's going to be questions. So what did they say? Like you it's could, a miracle, it's magic, it, you know, like what? You could not say anything and just move her off planet. Like right? get her off Wallach 9 get her out to like, you know, somebody like Reverend Mother Michaela 
who, you know, we see talk about how Michaela said that she used to be very jealous of Kasha being the emperor's true sayer, but she's found over time that there's just as much power to be had from the shadows. So I could see them like moving her off Wallach 9, getting her with a different reverend mother who can keep training her, but out of sight. Okay. And then you re-debut her years down the road. I was wondering if they would play it off like this is some type of prophecy type thing. Ooh, like a miracle? Yeah. Okay, okay, that could work too, because only the people who can access the Anarul room actually know what's down there. Right. They ha- they need that little key. Yeah, like their little fob that they use. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where the show is going. <laughs> like, I don't I either. Really, the only I have no idea. There are a handful of things that I can definitely identify. Some of it is like themes and motifs. We have a lot of revenge and manipulation. We have a lot of possible redemption arcs. There's themes of gender and power at play. But as far as like where these next three episodes are going, like I am dying to know. What's the end game set piece? Okay, where do you think this actually goes? Yeah, that's the question. What I'm, ho- I'll tell you what I'm hoping for. So we've got the three plot lines: the Harkonnen versus Atreides. We've got the breeding program and Valia's alignment to Mother Raquela. And then on the other hand, we've got Desmond with like big old question mark. Nobody, you know, we can only make guesses what's going on with him. And then we've got this intergalactic war that's about to happen due to these two houses. Right. In a way that I think that would really like just hit hard for me is if by the end of the season, we have wrapped up all of these interconnecting questions and plot lines with like one major like statement, one set piece that explains everything and details like how all these other connections are made. Because they do seem fairly interconnected in a way. I just don't know how. Yeah. It would be a travesty if a lot of it gets hand-waved. Like, we never learn how Desmond is out in the world Desmonding. Or we don't learn what happens with Lila if she wakes up. If they do a cliffhanger that kind of like answers one thing and then like leaves everything else cloaked in the shadows I won't like that (laughs) I need the data I need the answers right and I want it to be connected in a way that doesn't feel like it's just three multiple things happening and it's coincidentally involving a lot of people that have connections I have some questions that I don't know if there's necessarily answers to Okay. We learn later on that the Bene Gesserit have like a long standing plot for to push the Atreides of that time into power in Arrakis. And when we look at that, like we have Jessica and her work to push Paul into the position of what is it? Quizach Hadarash? Hadarash. Yeah. Yeah. And so I some I have to wonder if this is going to show some of the early, like if this show is eventually going to get to the point of like formulating that plan. I would assume that I, I feel like it has to, but I don't, at the same time, I don't want it to. <laughs> yeah. But I also think that it's going to show like, obviously how the Harkonnen house redeems themselves. And then that leads yeah, us this- to Inspector Gadget Man. That leads us to Worm God. Yeah, that leads us us to (laughs) Paul (laughs) Ashalu Jr. It's so unhinged. Jesus (laughs) Christ. (laughs) Oh, Dune is wacky. I love it. Uh, Yeah, I was trying to be kind of vague for anybody who doesn't know where it goes. I don't know about the connection to Paul. Like, it definitely feels like that's what this story is about like it even starts out at the beginning where it's like giving you a date like this many years before Paul Atreides and it's like okay 10,148 right I don't want it to be a house of the dragon scenario where it was like 
oh, like all of this stuff is going on. But actually the main story that we want to go with is it was all about Daenerys, you know? Like I want it to yeah. stand on its own and do its own thing. That's fine if that's like a drop in the hat where it's like, oh yeah, like, okay. Oh, I think it Eventually will. we get there. I think it'll stand on its own. I don't necessarily think that they're going to like name the Atreides as the family who they plan this for. I'm just curious if we start to see like the underlying yeah. plan to control the- Arrakis, yes. not just control it by force, but have the people of Arrakis support you, which is critical for spice harvesting. Right, right. That's another thing too that's wild about this show is because I like they're they're out here in the in the club snorting spice. Like it, it girls. Feels at spice, times. <laughs> spice is the most versatile product in the universe like you can Can bring people back to life you can bring people back to life you can use it in healing you can use it in tea for clarity you can power up energy with it isn't that a lot of what it's used for yeah that's why it's so valuable it's the gift that just endlessly gives right this brings me back to old desmond like how is he like the is he the the chosen one like the spice chose him the Shai Hulud chose him and he is now like some part of this prophecy because she does say after they learn the prophecy via Lila, she's like, it's Desmond Hart. Right. She said the key to the reckoning was once twice born in blood and, and spice. It's Desmond Hart. So is this going to be another twist where it was like, oh, we thought he was the one. Psych. It's about this dude that hasn't been born yet (laughs) thousands of years in the future. Carry on, ladies and gentlemen. I have (laughs) nothing to see here. Okay, so I also sometimes wonder if, let's say, we just take things how they are and Desmond is blessed by the creator, Worm God. And yes, so Worm God gives Desmond worm gifts. And what would be the point of that? And the main point I could see is, like, the worms are like, help us get these jackals out of here. Like, scare them yeah. away. Uh, here's True. some gifts to do some dastardly. Cause a little chaos. Do some yeah. dastardly deeds. Cause a little chaos. and a few lives. Get them out of here. Leave it to the Fremen and the worms. So it could work in that way if it's, like, the worm has sent Desmond to basically craft a plot to get everybody off Arrakis. But I, that would be wild. I have a hard time buying into, like, that this is just... How sentient are the worms? Well, not just that, because, I mean, to me, that that's really debatable, I guess. And I'd need a lot more background on the story and the lore and canon itself. But it just seems too obvious for a show like this. This show is all about, like, political intrigue, backstabbing, lying, manipulating, forward planning tactics, like something is easy as like, well, the worm blessed him with a gift and now he's next to a god. Seems yeah. too simple. This is the thing where I, f- I find myself often with the problem of all of the wacky stuff that my mind comes up with is typically not nearly as wacky as how the show will go. <laughs> where like I get in here and I'm thinking, okay, like, there's something behind the surface with everyone. And I really hype that up in my hopes and thoughts and prayers. And sometimes it doesn't turn out that way. I think with this show, though, if we get a couple of these big answers that we're talking about, just a couple, that'll be enough for me. I'll be really disappointed, though, if we don't get any answers. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope it's not that. Like, I'm hoping to get some solid answers in the next three episodes that'll give us a lot to work with for theory crafting for season two. Yeah. I I mean, I'm also going to go ahead and predict that there is going to be a season two, considering the show is stayed at number one on Max's like TV shows for the week or for the day for a multiple lengths of time now. Like every time I turn on Max, it's Dune prophecy at the top. Yeah, another thing that I'm hoping we get a little bit more into is the role of these rebels, like Kieran Atreides, the 
what is he like the master yeah. of jujitsu and the <laughs> like the <laughs> he is like, a rebel fighter who's some sort of like master swordsman and he became like the sword master of the palace somehow i'm sure his family name helped oh i have a feeling that he might turn his back on his rebel faction i do too he's gonna get caught up too. in those feelings and mm -hmm. forget his mission i think so too and i mean i feel like we've gotten just enough of that plot line to where it it has to come back in at some point. They wouldn't show that. They wouldn't have him be an Atreides if it was just a nothing burger. Right. Yeah, Occam's Razor. Ooh! Do you think that Kieran Atreides' goal is to actually avenge Tula's actions 30 years ago? Because remember, oh, she killed yeah. a big, big group of Atreides, but she let one get away. You know what would be wild is if he thinks it was Valia. They all believe Valia was behind it. And Tula is able to use that to her advantage and run a coup. Do you think she would? I think she's way too comfortable. Yeah, but I don't know if I'm at the point where I think she'll turn on Valia. It's going to take something with Lila to get her to turn on Valia. Yeah, I feel like she's at home in her little laboratory. And if you, if that stability was taken away from her if she couldn't do the things that she wanted to do you might see some pushback like if there was a chance of her being ousted in some way she might she'd be a try dangerous to one things. to try and oust right you'd have to hire right? a legion of poison tasters right i don't know because yeah with kieran and kieran atreides he definitely feels like another wild card yeah I don't think we've really seen, like, what he's in the story for as of yet, but I do think that it's going to tie into what Tula did in the past. Yeah. Otherwise, why have him around right. in the story? It's, personally, I think it's way too early to set the stage for the Atreides that we see, you know, 10,148 years later, because they're not even, like, the the Atreides family is not like the emperors of the Imperium. They just, they're just still one of the like big great houses and they get Arrakis from when the Harkonnens have, you know, their second fall. You know who else could be another wild card? Who? You have Gainey Harkonnen, Bobby B, because we just saw old, old, old Bobby B. Yeah, we Yves did Gainey. in his little motor scooter um <laughs> yeah, and his, hub, his, his rascal hover around his hover around it's literally a hover around <laughs> um yeah i noticed that like i don't know there was something about him being in the hover round that i was like that feels like it means something yeah he's definitely it looks like he's maybe he's uh like vaping the spice maybe that's keeping him al alive an extra long time or something because he's old old right why show him at the end of the episode like that? Yeah, especially because isn't the younger guy like in charge or is Bobby B still in charge? <laughs> we need an official show companion that breaks down like the current right factions within the the main great houses portrayed within the show because like is the guy is the younger guy I can't remember his name the younger Harkonnen actually in charge or is you know Bobby B still in charge and the younger guy is just like the the face of the family. Right. Yeah, I'm trying to think what Evgeny could be. Because he was upset after this mass death of Girl, he's been upset for 30 years. Yeah. What's his plan moving forward? What Does he have a say in something that happens in the future? Man, I don't know. This show you know, is wild. You know how <laughs> Valia keeps refusing to give Harkonnens a truth sayer? I have to wonder if it's because of Uncle Bobby B. Yeah, yeah. She's like, tell him the no. fourth time, no. <laughs> or is doing that all an elaborate setup to make it look like she's being hard on her own house when she's really like making moves to get them back to in avenge. power. Yeah, that's true. Like the old that's bait and true. switch. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you're out there, you are familiar with Dune at a much deeper level than Laura and I are, please give us some comments in the comment section. Let us know if we are out here in banana pants territory with some of these theories 
and let us know if any of them sound legitimate to you. Also, if you have some little like background info drops for us, I would love, love to go through and read some of that, especially with some of these characters. I would also love for anybody who's out here and we're just guessing Banana Pants Land to share their hypotheses with us as well. Yes, yes. And don't don't give us any major spoilers, please. Please, please. This is, typically I'm not like that. Usually I'm like, yeah, I don't care, whatever. Uh, but th- with this with this series, I'm, I'm really hoping that we get a big climax at the end and that it is very fulfilling. Me too. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you would like to support this channel, please boost this video by giving it a like. And if you want more, please subscribe. We will see you back at the end of the season to wrap up the last three episodes.